morning, everybody. Welcome once again to our Sunday morning time together as we get into some things that I think today are going to help you, stretch you, <laughs> maybe in some areas rock your world, your theological world, I don't know, but we're going to dive deep for, for two weeks now in this Unlimited series, which this, I guess, is part number five of the Unlimited series, and we're just starting to get into some really good things so this morning, if you have your Bible, let's go to 1 Corinthians. I want to start with 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and we're going to read four or five verses from there. Like I said, we're going to dive deep. We're going to talk about some things today. I'm going to talk about six, six basic things. I'm going to cover three this week that are fairly familiar, and I gen a lot of times I like to start with a familiar or what you know and then go to what you don't know, kind of build on what you know. So we're going to take it a little bit deeper today and maybe some areas that you have uh, heard before, contemplated before. Then next week we're going to move into some areas that I don't think I've ever heard taught anywhere <laughs> in my entire life. And I'm jumping off the deep end on that one next week. But anyway, let's lay some foundation today and let's talk about some things. We're going to get into some areas that I think are going to help you to, to clarify this unlimited area of living that's possible and should be um, approachable and amenable to all of us as we manifest as sons and daughters of God. All right, let's pick it up. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and I want to start with verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 says this, I has not seen, nor has ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those that love him. So Paul starts right out. Actually, this is a this is a quote back from Isaiah chapter 64, where Paul says, I hasn't seen, ear hasn't heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that love him. So you can kind of see there's an Old Testament concept there where it was all based on your ability to do. And I think Paul is pulling back on that passage from Isaiah to just reiterate that. The way we need to walk in an unlimited realm is not based on what we see with our natural eyes or hear with our natural ears. If you're going to depend on that, you're, you're not going to hear anything. It hasn't entered into our heart through those channels or through those means. Then in verse 10, he brings it up to the New Testament. So you got that planned in your mind? Eye hasn't seen, ear hasn't heard, not entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for him. I want to know what God's prepared for me, don't you? All right, so here he tells us in verse 10, he brings it up to New Covenant, and he says, but God. There's one of those but gods. Whenever you see a but God <laughs> in Scripture, make sure you pay close attention to what comes after the but God. So eye hasn't seen, ear hasn't heard, entered into the heart of man what God's prepared, but God has revealed them to us through his Spirit, capital S, for the Spirit, capital S, searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. All right, now let's pick it up down in verse 10. For what man, for what man knows the things of a man except the Spirit, small s, your Spirit. So your Spirit is how you perceive and how you know things. Of the man which is in him, even so no man knows the things of God except the Spirit, capital S, of God. Verse 12, now we have received not the spirit, small s, of the world, but the spirit, capital S, who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. So he says in verse 9, we can't know it by seeing, hearing, or natural senses. But then he tells us in verses 10 and uh, verse 10 and 12 that the way we pick up on it is a spirit-to-spirit -spirit contact. Our spirit picks up on what God's spirit is communicating and thereby we can know the things that are freely given to us of God. No man knows the things except his spirit. And we haven't received the spirit of the world. That's not the spirit we're living in. That's not the spirit that guides us or directs us. All right, let's, let's read verse 14. The natural man does not receive the things of the spirit, capital S, of God, for they are foolishness to him. Neither can he know them, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. So in, in that 14th verse, Paul just backs up what he's been telling us, that there's a spirit-to-spirit -spirit connection that begins to move us into, into a dimension and into a realm, into a, a place of consciousness that we never had by natural perception. And the only, thing, only things that uh, you can pick up on that really 
matters in life it, to you is the spirit, the spirit within you. The spirit within you is much more attuned to the things of God than your five physical senses. So he makes, he kind of makes a, a, a big deal out of this spirit to spirit connection. So we're talking about living in an unreal, unlimited realm today. We have been for five weeks. So we're gonna, we're gonna move out now a little bit from the shore. And first of all, I just want to thank God this morning for all the truth that he's revealing to people all over the world. Hasn't, isn't this an unbelievably good journey? I mean, that's the way I look at it. This, this is a journey. He's freeing the minds of the sons and the daughters, and that freedom feels so good. I remember when I first began to get a little bit free when I got a line on grace, on radical grace, hyper grace, grace that had no works attached to it. I remember the first book that I was reading on this kind of grace, and it just resonated so deep in my spirit. It was so freeing, and I, now my mind, my mind battled me with it. So I understand what Paul's saying, that I just... I doesn't see and ear doesn't hear and it hasn't entered into the heart of man. It certainly didn't enter into me that way when I hit this grace message and God began to free me up. Do you remember? Do you remember back when? Some of you, it's been a few years ago like me. It was back in 2003. That's 17, almost 18 years ago that I, I began to get free of all of the junk. And it came by spirit, spirit connection. And I started to learn things and to know things that I had never been taught, that I had never picked up on through my religious training. And I'm sure that was the way for you. And that felt, it was so liberating, so freeing. And that, that freedom that we, that we encountered then, uh, and I'm gonna take my watch off because I hit my table and it makes, makes it a noise and it jiggles the table. That freedom that we first encountered really put air under our wings, didn't it? And it elevated us. That was the launch pad. That was the launch point into a lot higher revelation than what we had ever had in our life. And you know what? This journey's just just begun. God's not dead. Spirit of truth is still active. He's opening avenues of truth to us that we've never considered before. So what the Father is saying to the sons is so strong, so revelatory, so unconventional that it's stretching, it's stretching our faith. My faith is stretched all the time. And I, I go, man, what more, what more can there be? But I know we just have entered into the very, very um, entrance of all of this. But it's just stretching our faith. And there, there are, there are wineskins busting all over the planet right now with the things that God is pouring out. And I just want to say something about this unlimited series that we're in right now. I, I'm calling it unlimited. But I want you to know that this series is not the end all be all. I don't want you to ever think that anything that I ever teach is the end all be all. I don't ever approach things that way. I, I approach it, it's, it's a step in the journey that we're at right now. We're, we're in the journey and we're taking the next step. And so as we walk into this unlimited, what is what we would look at as unlimited today, maybe next year, two years from now, we're not gonna look at as unlimited. It's going to be the norm. There's a new norm developing. And the new norm is living in an unlimited realm, living in a consciousness that is not held back by anything. So I just, I always just like, I, I, I just like to mention that because I never want you to pick up an attitude from me or a spirit from me that says, look, this is the way it is, this way it'll always be. There's no more to this. We've reached the sum, summit of, <laughs> of all revelation on this. That's absolutely not true. And I don't want to ever portray that. So what I want to do, I want to take two weeks and I want to look at some things that he has deposited into our life that are unlimited. He's taking us from a limited area to an unlimited area. And I think there's five or six strong areas. I know there's five that are really relevant and there's one that I'm going to get to next week. I, like I said, never heard anybody teach on it, but there's enough in scripture about it that I want to at least open the door to unlimited in that area. But I'm not going to get to that till next week. So let me just talk about some things. Six places that we're moving from an from a limited dimension to an unlimited dimension. And it's it's coming like he said in uh in this ninth and tenth verse of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, the unlimited, the limited held us by what we could see, what we could hear, what we, we could perceive, 
with our five physical senses. Our five physical senses sends data to our brain, then our brain makes a decision at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, makes a decision of it's right, wrong, good, evil, do, don't do, based on the data that's fed to us. Now you and I have learned that there's, there's another dimension to life, it's the dimension of spirit. And we have never been groomed to live in spirit, we've been groomed to live in natural. So as we, as we learn about spirit, it all becomes, a, it's, it's a little bit unfamiliar ground for some of us, especially for those of you that are just coming into the digital cathedral. Uh, it probably would pay you to go back and look at some previous teachings. I looked this week and I think I have 361 videos, 361 teaching sessions up on YouTube. So you can go back and find teaching on almost anything that you wanna find. And I can't put my finger on it for you. Sometimes people message me and say, do you have a message on this and this and this? I, to be honest with you, they all, run, they all run together, man. But if you're around long enough, you're gonna hear me touch a lot of different areas, probably the area that you're, you're looking for. So let's look at this first area that we're moving from limited to unlimited. Number one is this. We're moving into a place of unlimited vision. And what I mean by that is the ability to see in the spirit. The Father has been working in us to open the eyes of our inner man. And when we talk about seeing in the spirit, we're not talking about, you know, these eyes up here. We're talking about eyes in our, in our inner man. Uh, let's, look, I'm gonna read quite a bit of scripture today because I, I want you to know that what I'm telling you is not crazy, but it's in the Bible, all right? So I know that most of us, we like to see it in scripture. So look, look at this, Colossians chapter one, verse 25. I'm gonna read verse 25, 20, and 26. Paul said, I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. That's a big assignment, to fulfill the word of God. So Paul said, Paul said in that 25th verse, that he has become a minister according to the stewardship uh, you know, the administration, what had been placed in his hand from God, which was given to him for us, that he could fulfill the word of God. And he says in verse 26, the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but has now been revealed to his saints. So do you see right there, he's, he's moving from, an, from a limited to an unlimited. He said, we were limited by this mystery. A mystery is something that you you can't solve, it, it's not evident to you. You watch a murder mystery on television and, it, and at first you don't know who done it. But as the program unfolds, there, there are clues and there are more clues until finally, maybe at the end, you can make a pretty good guess who done it, right? Who did the murder? So Paul is saying that we were in a limited realm. We had this mystery in front of us. We, we couldn't see clearly. But he said now he's beginning to show us and reveal to the saints this mystery. So as he reveals, he's moving us then from that limited dimension of mystery to the unlimited dimension of mystery revealed. Um, can you see that? I want you to see that because it's, it's, it, you can't believe something till you see it. And so if you can see that he's beginning to reveal mysteries to us, then you can believe it. You can, you can begin to enter into that. You can begin to grasp it. You can begin to get a hold of it. But first you have to see it. So the mystery now is opening up. It's not becoming dark anymore. We're, be, we're beginning to see. And because we see it, now we can begin to believe this mystery, which he tells us in verse 27, to them them who, them saints that the mystery is being revealed to, God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery. Here it is. This mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So this mystery that nobody understood in generations gone by, but now is being revealed to the saints, is taking us out of this limited dimension of seeing and now we're beginning to see this Christ that is within us. And I'll tell you what, that, op that opens the door to so much. But you have to see it before you can believe it. And I, I, I think that's important for us in this generation to understand that you have to see it before you can believe it. People have said that they believe a lot of things 
that they never saw and it made hypocrites out of us. I, I was pushed into that box of saying, yes, I, I believe I believe in Jesus. I believe he's my savior. I believe he died on the cross. I, believe, I, I said, I believe all of that, but you know what? I never had revelation of it. And so it made me a little bit of a hypocrite and because we never had revelation of it, we never, we never could believe it. So what we ended up doing is saying we believed a lot of things that we didn't see. And you said you believed it. Here's why you said you believed it. Here's why I said I believed it. It's because I didn't want to face the consequences they told me I would have eternally if I didn't say that I believed. So what? when, when, when God's going to drop you into a deep fryer for eternity, like a turkey in a deep fryer, of course you're going to say you believe because you want to make sure you jump through the hoops and touch, touch all the bases so that you don't have a problem then, right? But I didn't see it. There wasn't a revelation. He didn't, I didn't see him like Paul saw him on the road to Damascus or, you know, the disciples saw him or that knowing. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't have the perception inwardly. I, the, it was a mystery, but the mystery hadn't been resolved, hadn't been solved for me. I didn't see it. I didn't see Christ in me. Paul didn't see Christ in him all his life, but he said when it pleased the Father who separated him from his mother's womb to reveal the Christ that was in him. Always oh, been in him, but he didn't see it. But when he saw it, he could believe it. So that's what I'm trying to, trying to hit on with this. We're coming into a place of vision. The Father wants us to see with a very sharp spiritual vision. The Father doesn't get any pleasure out of us, out of you and me walking around in darkness, bumping into the walls and the door because we can't see. He's always been big about sharpening our vision. And Paul said in Ephesians chapter 1, you remember so many of these verses that, that we're pulling out, I'm, I'm hoping you are able to pull up from our study. We did at the start of the year from Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. So many of these verses we really looked at in a little bit of depth at least. But the Father always has wanted you to see sharply. And Paul wanted, Paul wanted the saints to see with clarity, with good vision, unlimited vision. So he said in verse 13, he said, I pray that the eyes of your understanding, inner eyes, eyes of spirit, that they would be enlightened, that somebody would turn the light on, that you'd be able to see, that you may know. Here's why he wanted them to see, that you might know the hope of his calling and what are the riches of his glory in the inheritance of the saints. He wanted you to see sharply so you could see what your inheritance was. See, in, in this testament, which is, a testament's a legal document, but a covenant is a relational, um, a relational connection that, that there is no end to. So this inheritance that you have comes as a result of a covenant that God has made with you through Christ. The Father and the Son made a covenant, and you and I have an inheritance in that, in that covenant. So he says, I want you to be able to see that. I want, it to, I want it to become real to you. I want it to become evident to you. Then he says in verse 19, and he says, I want you to see what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. Man, if there's anything that puts that in an unlimited dimension, it's what he says in that verse 19. Look what he says. He says, in effect, I want you to know the power that a believer has. And he says the power that a believer has is according to the working of his mighty power. And I gotta tell you, his power is unlimited. So when he says, I want the eyes of your understanding to be open, number one, so you know what your inheritance is, which is unlimited, there's no end to it. And number two, I want you to know the power that is working within you. It's the, it, it is the power that works through God within your life. It's the power of his spirit working within you. So what I'm pulling out of those two verses is for all of us, because the ability has been given to all of us to develop an unlimited vision. It's not just a gift to a few. And we're, we gotta get over that hump. It's not a gift to a few. It's not, it's not just for a few people to see, then come tell you what they saw. See, we've, done, we've depended on that way too much. We've depended on the pastor to come tell us what he sees or the prophet what he sees. That's not what, that's not what Paul's after here. And that's not what, what manifesting as a son is about. Manifesting as a son and a daughter is understanding that you enter that dimension where you have unlimited vision. 
Seeing in the spirit, this unlimited vision I'm talking about in this first point is so important because it directs where you're going. It helps you to, it helps you to not blindly, you know, stumble through life. So unlimited vision. How do we develop that? How do we develop seeing in the spirit? All right, let me talk just a little bit about this. And I can't spend a lot of time on it because i got two more points to cover. The first thing to be able to develop seeing in the spirit, the first thing we have to do is to develop a sensitivity of seeing out of the inner man and not the physical eyes. It's another whole dimension. We don't see out of our physical eyes. We see out of the eyes that are in here. Paul said in that 18th verse, the eyes of your understanding. The eyes of your understanding, you see sometimes, let me make this practical. And these are things you develop. You develop the sensitivity to this. Sometimes it comes because you feel a prompting. Sometimes it comes by intuition. Uh, some of you are gonna learn to see because you know that you know. I, I'm talking to some of you that, that you know exactly what I'm talking about, promptings. He's, I see a lot by prompting. I see a lot by prompting, some by intuition. There have been a lot of times that I just know that I know especially when I come into uh, revelation or I come into truth, man, it just, it just, it drops so strong in, inside of me that I know that I know. I don't know up here, this battles me and I haven't figured it all out, but I know there's something there. I know there's a truth there. Uh, but all of it comes out of your inner man, not your head. That's the point. So you have to begin to let these rivers of water flow out of you. This is, this is, this is how we see. Is it, it, it begins to roll all out of us. Paul also said this, and this is key. He said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 18, he said, we don't look at the things that are seen. Now, if you're going to walk in unlimited vision, you've got you to train yourself that what you see does not move you. What the doctor says does not move you. What the bank account says does not move you. While we look not at the things that are seen, we look at the things that are not seen out of here. And here's why. Because the things that are seen are temporary. They're all fluctuating. They change all the time. Uh, but the things that are not seen are the things that are eternal. So when you come into this place of unlimited vision, you're moving out of, out of, out of a level of consciousness that is fluctuating and may, has made you live this life like this, up and down. When you see things that are good, you get the job, the promotion's great, but when all of a sudden the stock market drops and your 401k is gone down, all of a sudden you're, you're, you're depressed. Living by what you see causes these emotional swings in our life. I, I'm sorry, they just do. But you have to train yourself that you don't look at that. You look at the promptings, you look at the intuition, you look at the knowing that you know. Right? You, 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 you begin to perceive what comes out of this inner man so that you, you begin to uh, undo this chasing of circumstances and that all of the praying that you've done every time the circumstances hit a blip, hit a bump in the road, then you're in there on your face and knees bawling and squalling and begging God to do something about these little circumstances. You're always trying to get the wrinkles ironed out because you don't want to face any pain in life. Let's be honest. Nobody enjoys pain. I'm not saying that you do. But in the 17th verse of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18, where he says, don't look at the things that are seen. He said, you get your focus on things that are not seen. Because in verse 17, he said, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of, of him. Okay, that's good. But then when we get over to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 17, he says this. All right, so we're not looking at the things that we see. If we're going to walk into an un, unlimited dimension of seeing, we don't look at what we see. Don't look, at, don't look at the monthly financial report if you're a business. I deal with business guys all the time, and some of them, I'm telling you what, every time something stops up, they, they are shaken. They are shaken in their boots because it's not going according to what they think and what they see. Now watch what he says in the 17th verse. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working in us a far greater and exceeding eternal weight of glory. 
what, what's he saying there? All right, listen to me. If you don't remember anything else this morning, I want you to remember this. Sometimes enduring a little problem will lead to big results. Let me say that again. That's what he's saying in 17. This little light affliction that we're facing right now, that's nothing compared to the glory that we'll, we'll face and be in, endued with in him. Let me, let me get the exact wording. I don't, want to, I don't want to lead you astray here. He says, for the light affliction, which is but for a moment. See, that's why you, you don't want to be moved by it. You don't want to be moved by what you're seeing for a moment. Because it, it's, it's going to change. He says it's there for a moment. He said it's working in us a far more exceeding and eternal rate, weight of glory. <clears throat> so let me say this again. Sometimes, enduring a little problem, are you listening to me? Enduring a little problem will lead to big solutions. For example, Paul's thorn in the flesh. On the scale of eternity, it was a small, small dilemma, small problem. Paul was, Paul was harassed. I know what the thorn of flesh is. It was Judaizers, they followed Paul everywhere they went. They harassed him. Paul would come into a town, teach grace. People would get on fire. Paul would leave town. The Judaizers would follow and say, Paul was a false teacher. Don't believe what the man's telling you. You have to be circumcised to be saved. And so they, they disrupted, they up, tried to uproot everything that Paul did, and it got on his nerves. It was on his last nerve. So he goes to God and he says, man, this has got to stop. This is, this, is, this is driving me nuts. And God said, no, 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 no. So what, what happened with Paul? That he endured that little problem, and what did it do? It led to this big solution. He had a revelation of the sufficiency of God's grace. God said, my grace is sufficient for you. Paul would have never seen the sufficiency of the grace of God if he had not gone through and was able to endure the little problem. The little, and I know when you're facing a little problem, it can seem huge. It's kind of like surgery, you know. All, all surgery is relatively minor unless they're operating on my body and then it's, my, taking my tonsils out would be major. I'm, I've never been in the hospital, never been cut on, never lost tonsils, nothing. I've never even had chicken pox, measles, or childhood diseases. So if I were to face those things, I'm telling you what, it would probably be a mountain in my mind. So I, I fully, I get it, I get it. But Paul says what works out in that is a far greater weight of glory if you can come through it, all right? So seeing in the Spirit, if I could just narrow the funnel down a little bit, seeing in the Spirit is essentially seeing through the eyes of the Father. It's seeing like Father sees. Father is spirit, right? God is spirit. You are spirit. So again, developing an unlimited vision is going to come down to you desiring to do what Paul said in uh, Ephesians 1, 18, 19, and that is allowing the eyes of your understanding to be opened, to be enlightened, so that you could begin to see your inheritance, the hope of your calling, and all that he has prepared for you as a son. I might come back to, I might do a short series on this because I think the, the, the sight thing is big. The sight thing is big. Learning how to see and, and navigate into spirit by spiritual perception. But let me just move along this morning because I've, I've spent 28 minutes on point number one and I've only got, you know, maybe 20 minutes to cover the last two. So here's the second one. Second one area that he's moving us from limited to unlimited is in our knowledge. Knowledge, knowledge. We're not talking about the knowledge that Adam had from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We're not talking about uh, expanding your ability to know what's right and wrong, what's, what's good, what's bad, what's left, what's right. We're talking about the knowledge that comes from eating at the tree of life. Paul understood the limitations of knowledge. He understood that limited realm of knowledge. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, love chapter, verse 9. I was just going to quote it to you, but every time I'm going to quote it, I go, man, you better read it just to make sure you get the wording right. He says in verse 9 of, of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, he says, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. Do you see the limited? In fact, if you back up to verse 8, he says, whether there are prophecies, they will fail because they're, they're limited. They're in a, a dimension of being limited. How many prophecies have been given to you that have never materialized? 
And he says, where there are tongues, they will cease. Where there is knowledge, it will vanish away. He's, he's talking totally limited realm here. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. He's talking about limited dimension right there. We know in part. And that's, that's where we've lived for 2,000 years. And we've pretty much accepted it. We've pretty much accepted the fact that we, we're limited. We, we, we don't know what we would really like to know. Paul had revelations beyond measure, and yet he recognized still, even with those revelations, that he was, he was knowing in part, and he felt that limit. Paul bumped up against that limit all the time, and yet, even though he, he saw that limitation, he also saw, he fully saw a place that was beyond limits in knowledge that we could, that we could enter into. So he reminds the church in Ephesus, Let's come back to, uh, let's come over just a little bit to the right in your Bible. Ephesus chapter 3. Ephesus chapter 3. So he reminds them of this in Ephesus chapter 3 and verse 19. He says, to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. So if you want to tap into the love of Christ, you're going to have to get past your natural thinking, that, that limited dimension. And he says, when you do, he said, you will know and you will be filled with the fullness of God. So I want you to see the limited there. And he says, we're going to go from the limited to the unlimited. To know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. So to enter into that dimension, to know the love of Christ, is going to, you're going to have to move out of, out of the impart dimension. And if and, and the reward of that is to be filled with the, all the fullness of God. And I'll tell you what, that's an unlimited realm. <clears throat> that's an unlimited realm. And Paul, Paul's saying, look, this, this is available. This is what we need to do. Verse 20, he says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think. So he's saying unlimited. Able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask, limited, or think limited. So he's saying there's unlimited that is beyond the limited. And he said it, it that is working according to the power that is within us. <clears throat> so again, he ascribes he ascribes this this place this unlimited. He ascribes it to the power of God that is working within us. Paul's motive was to know him, no question about it. Above everything else, he wanted to know him because knowing him is the doorway to the unlimited. That's exactly what he was saying here. To know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. So if you're going to know him, you're going to have to move past normal thinking. So I'm, 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 trying, to, I'm trying to pull you at least uh, to acknowledge that we, we've, we've functioned in an impart dimension. And because we're doing a series on unlimited, I'm, I'm, I'm challenging you to just begin to, at least at this point in the series, just to consider, you know what, maybe there's a whole lot more out there. Maybe, maybe we're, we're, we haven't even uh, entered into the, the first inning. Maybe we're, we're still in the dugout. The game hasn't even started yet. Jesus operated in that dimension. He knew. In John chapter two, John chapter two. Let's read a little. Let's read a little uh, happening from the life of Jesus that shows that. In John chapter two, verse twenty-four. Let's. I want to read verse twenty-four and twenty-five. It says Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men. Do you think he knew all men? Do you think you and I can know all men by natural knowledge, by limited knowledge? Absolutely not. To know all men is going to have to put us into an unlimited dimension. Jesus knew all men, so he was functioning in that unlimited realm. Well, if Jesus could function in the unlimited realm, do you not think you can function in it as well? Then he says in verse 25, and he had, and he had need that no one should testify of man. He didn't pe need people come tattle on people. Didn't need people come say, you know what, let me tell you about Fred. Let me tell you about Susie. You gotta watch out for them. He didn't need that. Because he knew, he knew what was in man. All right. So verse 20 is 
all things. He, he, he understood. He could see. And that opens the door. Uh, that opens the door to an entirely bigger, deeper dimension. Jesus knew what was in the heart of those that he encountered. And he knew it because he walked in union with the Father. Do you remember just a couple of weeks ago, I, I taught you about uh, consciousness, developing a 24-7 consciousness. That's what Jesus had. He had the mind of, of omniscience operating within him. He had the mind of the Father. They were one together. That was not a word of knowledge that Jesus had when he said, I, I know what's in people. That was not a word of knowledge. Listen, listen. A word of knowledge, those gifts of the Spirit are all in part. They're not full. They're not perfect. They're in part. To Jesus, the thoughts and intents of a man's heart were as clear to him. He knew them as much as if the man had expressed words. That's the realm. That's the place the Father's calling us into. Can you imagine if we could get into a place where we were never duped, never cheated, never lied to because we knew what was in man, because omniscience was working in us? Sons and daughters enter into that realm of fullness when they're led by the Spirit and they're motivated by the mind of Christ. Led by the Spirit, motivated by the mind of Christ. I mean, you talk about heavy revy, brother. Right there it is. Mind of Christ, led by the Spirit. Put those two together and all of a sudden you and the Father are thinking in sync. And that's the portal into the unlimitedness of the Father. Coming into sync with him, seeing through his eyes, your spirit coming into conscious union with his spirit. All right, take a deep breath. I know this unlimited series is stretching you. It's going to stretch you even more. But to be as he is in this present world is going to require that we allow some new wine to come into these wineskins. And if you've been with me at the Digital Cathedral, I hope that your wineskin is flexible. It's not hard and brittle, so it'll bust but you're able to contract when new wine enters in. Number one, unlimited vision. Number two, unlimited knowledge. Let me hit one more. Unlimited anointing. Unlimited anointing. John chapter one. Don't, don't, don't leave me now. I, I, I know I've been going about 35 minutes. Don't leave me now. I'm, this, is, this, is, this, is the be, this is the better of any of the other three points, and I want you to get, make sure you get this. Unlimited anointing. Here's, a, here's how it was in Jesus. John 132. And John bore witness saying, I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove and the spirit remained upon Jesus. The spirit remained upon him. If you have your Bible, underline remained upon him. It didn't leave. It didn't depart. He says in verse 33, I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptized in the, in the Holy Spirit. So John knew that when, when the Spirit descended on Jesus, when the anointing descended on Jesus and remained there, it didn't leave. That's the one. That's the anointing of Jesus that moves him into this unlimited realm and it remained on him. And from that point forward, it launched Jesus into a place where he did not have to have to depend on limitation that he had the first 30 years of his life. No recording of miracles, no recording of supernatural. Jesus lived like you and I, for the most part, for the first 30 years of his life. All of the unlimiteds are breakthroughs for us past the, un, past the impart dimension. That's what I wanna say. All of the unlimiteds, these unlimiteds, have, of sight, of knowledge, of anointing. All of those are, break, are breakthroughs for us out of this, in part, prison that has held us for so many years. Jesus the man had to move beyond mere human to the eternal Christ to live in unlimited. Jesus the man was limited. Jesus the man was limited in his knowledge. Jesus, the flesh man, had limitations. It was the eternal Christ that rested on him, the eternal spirit that rested on him, that anointed him, that allowed him to break through. Right. 
while you're in John 1, come over to John chapter 3. Let's read a couple of verses out of there. John chapter 3, verse 34. Hope you're getting something out of this because this, this is strong stuff. This is, not, this is not milk. This is strong meat. All right, verse 34. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of the one who sent me and to finish his work. John chapter, I'm sorry, that's chapter four. Let me get chapter three. John chapter three, watch. John chapter three, verse 34. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God does not give the spirit by measure. When the Father gives the spirit, it's not in a limited dimension. It's an unlimited amount of spirit that he pours to us, just like he poured to Jesus. If the Spirit of God dwells in you, and it does, if Christ is in you, and he is, then you have an unlimited supply that is available. He does not give the Spirit by measure to any of us at no time ever. He doesn't, there's no junior Holy Spirit. There's no adolescent Holy Spirit. There's no peewee Holy Spirit. It's, beyond, it's without measure. That's how he gives it. Verse 35 that the Father loves the Son and has given all things, unlimited, has given all things into his hands. Now, that those two verses, I mean, you can't read those without seeing there is no limitation to that. The literal meaning of Christ is anointed one. An anointing is nothing more than a divine enablement. It's, it's an empowerment. It's an endowment that it, that that will propel you past anything that you can naturally do. It was that unlimited anointing that Jesus had that produced the unlimited life that he lived who ministered in an unlimited dimension. It all came back to the anointing. The anointing produced the unlimited life and the unlimited dimension that Jesus lived and ministered in. Now you take the Christ off Jesus and you know what? He's just a regular dude like you and me. You take the Christ off of Jesus, he's a regular guy. The hypostatic union, 100% human, 100% divine. Jesus was the human, Christ was the divine. Together, they are Jesus the Christ. You as a spirit are just limited. But when you have the Christ within, there is a hypostatic union. There is a joining together. And you cross over from that dimension of limited to un unlimited. Let me bring this right down to your life. Don't leave me now. I, just give me, give me another eight or 10 minutes. Can you do that? Give me another eight or 10 minutes. I wanna bring this number three right into your life. First John chapter two. First John chapter two. I want, you, got, you have to get this. You have to see this. You, you probably need to go back and look at this teaching a couple of times, two or three times. I mean, I, I probably studied 40 hours, 45 hours putting this 45, 50 minute teaching together because I, 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 I can see it, I see it, I got it, I grasp it, I'm beginning to, to, to move in it, I got it, but now watch here, this unlimited anointing comes into you. First John chapter two, verse 20. First John chapter two, verse 20. But you have an anointing from the Holy One. Are you ready? And you know all things. Do you think John was lying there? I think he's pulling your leg? You have an anointing and you, point number two, know all things. How do you know all things? By the anointing? <laughs> Verse 27, same chapter. Verse 27, same chapter. But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you. Now let me take you back to Jesus. When the Spirit descended on Jesus, it remained. The anointing that you have received from him abides in you. That means it builds a habitation, builds a house. It's not leaving, it's not going, it's not coming, right? Now, I, 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 I know what you were taught in church. I know what you were told in church, that the anointing comes and it goes. And if you fast, if you fast, you can increase your anointing. No, you can't. You have got all the anointing that you're ever going to have. You're never gonna have any more anointing than you have this morning on this first Sunday of December, 2020. You've got all the anointing you're ever gonna have. Your understanding of it, your consciousness of it, is gonna increase. And as it does, he moves you from the limited to the unlimited. It abides on you. 
It's made a permanent home. The same thing that we read about Jesus. So what they told you in church that if you fast, you can increase the anointing. If you can get Benny Hinn to lay hands on you, it will increase your anointing. If you can get the greater the man of God that lays a hand on you, the more it will increase your anointing. That is a bunch of hogwash. And hogwash in Greek means hogwash. You have an anointing and you know all things. You have an unlimited dimension and realm that you're entering into, my brother and sister. Can you see it? Because if you can see it, you can believe it. If you don't see it, you can't believe it. So just let it crock pot. Let it slow cook. The anointing that Jesus had fell on him. But the anointing that you have arises from within. See, it's that anointing that enables you to see. It's that an that anointing that enables you to know. It's that anointing that enables you to function. It doesn't fall on you. It rises from within you. Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Out of your belly flows the life of God. See, verse 27, verse 20 and verse 27 are some of the two most powerful verses in the new covenant that deal with unlimited. There is absolutely no limitation in those two verses. You have a supernatural endowment that has no limitation to it. So you're no longer, you no longer have to function in this in part realm that he talked about in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We know in part, we prophesy in part, knowledge vanishes away. We're not looking at that knowledge that vanishes away. We're looking at things that are not seen, which are eternal, Paul said. It's the 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12. It's when that which is perfect is come, that that which is in part shall be done away. You know what the perfect is? It's that face-to-face -face that you have with the Father. We're looking into that mirror, and we're starting to see with clarity. And what we're seeing, we're being conformed or transformed into the same image that we're seeing. When you come face-to-face -face with Father, when you are consciously aware of His presence, and you live there, and you function there, do you know what? You'll be conformed into the very thing that you're seeing. That level of anointing is our inheritance. I'm sorry, it is absolutely our inheritance. It's our right, without measure. Romans chapter 8, verse 32 says, How shall he not with Christ freely give us all things? The things I'm talking to you about this morning, and I hit three that I know you're at least a little familiar with, vision, knowledge, and anointing. I want, but I want you to begin to see them on a scale like you've never seen them before. Because Digital Cathedral, we're going some places we've never been, and it's going to be quite a trip. I fully realize, I'm going to say it again, this unlimited series, I'm pushing the norm. I'm pushing the norm to a new level. And when I say norm, I'm saying that for the sons and the daughters of God, unlimited, unlimited is becoming the new norm. Can you, can you handle that? Can you handle that? There has to be a people who have an ear to hear. There has to be a people that are willing to say, I really believe all things are possible to those that believe. Now remember, you don't believe till you see. So my job is to help you see. I can't see for you, but I can bring you over to the water trough of sight so that what you see now, you can begin to believe and begin to walk it out. Now, I want, to, I want to take the pressure off of you. We can't do any of this. I can't, I can't have unlimited vision, unlimited knowledge, or unlimited anointing. I can't do any of it on my own. It has to come from him. And when the time is right, when everything lines up, he releases it. It, 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 it comes like all things the Father gives. It comes by grace. It comes as a divine influence that creates change in us. And all we do is rest in him. So I'm, I'm encouraging you, open up to the unlimited. But I'm also saying, don't, don't try to break your believer. Don't get yourself all in a tizzy because the pressure's not on you. It's on him to prepare you to receive unlimited. You, you just be like a cucumber that, that soaks in that bottle of vinegar and know that as you soak in that bottle of vinegar, that anointing, as you soak in that, that eventually you're gonna become a pickle. 
It's just a natural process. Embrace the process. Let's be happy with the process. Let's be excited about the process. Whatever we face is the process. Don't worry about it. That's what makes us into what we are to become. That's what makes this whole journey exciting. What, what, a, what an exciting journey it is. We've talked about some deep things today. We've dove a little bit deep and next Sunday we're gonna dive a little bit deeper. Make sure you're with me Wednesday night. We'll talk a little bit more about this. Uh, as you probably notice, I'm, in a, I'm using my other background. I've had people say that the wall, I, I really like the bare wall, but people said that it was a little, um, you know, wasn't appealing. So I brought you down to where it might be a little bit more appealing. So tell me what you think. But anyway, let me pray for you. I just want to say a quick prayer. Father, right now, this thing of unlimited, may, it, may our eyes be open to it. May we embrace it. We don't understand it all. Our heads are swimming this morning. Father, we admit it. But we also know that you told us we have an anointing and we know all things. So Father, we're open to it. Every person at the Digital Cathedral, lead them step by step, wherever they're at in the journey, take them along the way, Father. And we praise you and bless you for it. God bless you. Thank you for being with me. See you next Sunday morning, 10 a.m. Central, and this Wednesday, 8 o'clock Central, on the Don Keithley Ministry page. Have a wonderful Sunday. Rest, have a good dinner, and we'll see you next time.